Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. When we left off last time, the English privateers in the Atlantic were busy repairing their prize, the Madre de Dios. They were getting her ready as quickly as possible. By morning they had her seaworthy, which was none too soon. As the sun rose, they saw a flotilla of Spanish warships headed in their direction. Had Madre de Dios been on her own, they would have been caught almost immediately. However, they were lucky enough to have six privateer vessels serving as escort. Those were lighter and faster than the Spanish ships, and whenever one of the Spanish vessels got too close, an English ship could fall back and engage and give the Carrick time to pull ahead and then reconnoiter with her. As they left Spanish waters and entered English waters, the Spanish ships fell back. They were at war with England, and it would be too dangerous to continue the pursuit, so Madre de Dios made it safely back to England. Richard Hakelut tells of her arrival in Dartmouth and gives a full accounting of the sheer size of this ship. And then he writes, quote, This perfect commensuration of the parts appeareth the hugeness of the whole, far beyond the mold of the biggest shipping used among us. End quote. This was the largest ship ever seen in England. She dwarfed every other ship in Dartmouth Harbor. Her masts stood well above the houses on the shoreline. A ship like that was going to draw attention. Once word got out that a ship had arrived that was so impressive people came to sea, and once word got out just what was on board that ship, people began to make their way on board. They explored the vessel, and before long they were swarming the deck of Madre de Dios. They began to carry away goods and riches in amazing quantities. It started slow, but it became a torrent of people. They ransacked the ship for maybe an hour before the crew was able to get the situation under control, but even then, they weren't able to stem the tide entirely. Over the following weeks, despite a heavy guard on board, plunder just kept slipping away. People of ill repute arrived in Dartmouth from all across southern England. They arrived to steal and buy and sell whatever cargo was available there. Sir Walter Raleigh was dispatched from London on the Queen's orders to restore order and to oversee the safe shipment of the cargo. They weren't going to sail the Madre de Dios through the Channel. Now that it was at an English port, they were going to carry the treasure overland to ensure that nobody could recapture their prize. The Queen, who had heard many varying reports of exactly what to expect, didn't believe her eyes at first. She was elated with the prize and the plunder that came from the capture of that ship. At the time, in 1592, that was fully half of England's treasury. That same report stated, as a conclusion, quote, God's great favor towards our nation, who, by putting this purchase into our hands, hath manifestly discovered those secret trades and Indian riches which hitherto lay strangely hidden and cunningly concealed from us. End quote. The English discovery of exactly what the Indies had to offer would change the shape of English foreign policy, indeed European foreign policy, forever. This is episode 127, Secret Trades and Indian Riches. So what exactly was the cargo? What were these Indian riches that could change and so profoundly shape the history of England? That same report by uh, Mr. Robert Adams gives a full accounting. He writes, quote, To give you a taste, as it were, of the commodities, it shall suffice to deliver you the catalogue taken the 15th of September, 1592, where, upon good view, it was found that the principal wares, after the jewels, which were no doubt of great value, consisted of spices, drugs, silks, calicoes, quilts, carpets, and colors. End quote. Mr. Adams talks at great length about what they found on board. The spices like pepper, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, the drugs like frankincense and aloe, the fabrics he goes into some length about, the many different types of calico and silk to be found on board, the pearls, the ambergris, which was highly valuable. He talks about the 
less valuable but greater in number goods, the porcelain china, the coconuts, the ebony wood. In the end, he writes of this plunder, quote, being divided among the adventurers, whereof Her Majesty was chief, was sufficient to yield contentment to all parties, end quote. And as we will see, that certainly wasn't the case. Many parties were anything but content in the end. As far as the spices were concerned, in terms of quantity, the ship carried 425 tons of pepper, 45 tons of cloves, 35 of cinnamon, 3 of mace, and 3 of nutmeg. Now that's a singularly rich haul, but why did that influence the world so much? Well, first of all, let me address the very real possibility that I, and many of the historians I'm working from, may be placing too much emphasis on the capture of that one ship. If you look at it from a trends and forces approach to historical study, it's pretty clear that everything that was about to come was going to happen anyway. But in this case, this one instance, I think it's appropriate to look at things from the great man approach to historical study, or in this case, the great woman approach. See, Queen Elizabeth is the linchpin to this entire story. She had to sign off on any major business ventures undertaken by any of her subjects, and she was very often reluctant to do so unless you had very good evidence that your business venture was a good idea. For example, if you, say, wanted to found a trade corporation that was going to operate in the East Indies, well, she needed good, good evidence there. I mean, the East Indies were obviously a rich market, but they were dangerous, they were expensive, and they were potentially destructive to the war effort. Elizabeth was not going to be easily swayed in that decision. But there was one party in particular, I should say at least one party in particular, that was interested in starting that trade. They wanted to open up the East Indies market, the family of the Hawkins. Remember that at least one of them, William Hawkins, had been to the East Indies with Francis Drake on the circumnavigation. What they needed were they to convince Elizabeth was real evidence that the East Indies would be a valuable enough market to invest that kind of capital. Now, of course, that evidence was freely available in the East Indies, but they had to get it closer to home. Now, I imagine that the Hawkins family had a network of spies and informants in Spain. I'd be frankly surprised to hear if they didn't. And one of those spies may just have slipped a juicy tidbit to the Hawkins concerning Madre de Dios. That's rampant speculation, I have no evidence at all of that, but that tidbit would certainly have been sufficient to convince someone like Lord Clifford to join into the venture. It would have been enough to convince Lord Clifford to petition the Queen for the release of Sir Walter Raleigh. And it wasn't the plunder that gripped them. I mean, that was certainly a draw. It would have interested the Hawkins and certainly regular privateer captains, but it wouldn't have been enough for men like Clifford. No, he was far more interested in the potential that that plunder could offer. The potential for secret trades and Indian riches. Riches unlike anything that England had ever seen before. Enough that maybe they could sway the queen. Of course, attempting to sway the queen in any fashion was a long and detailed process. They needed not only the evidence of the potential riches to be made, but also a solid business plan. They needed ships as well, and men to sail them, and an outline of where they intended to call. And, at least on that last account, Madre de Dios helped immensely. They had the ship's records and maps which allowed them to make such a plan. But all of that took time. It was an effort of years. And Lord Clifford set about working on it immediately. He shopped the idea around to all of the influential friends he had there in London. He brought men and money into the fold. But even more importantly, there at first, he began constructing new ships. Three years after the capture of Madre de Dios in 1595, his newest flagship was launched, and that ship has what just might be my favorite ship name of all time. 
You know, pirate ship names are usually cool. You've got Queen Anne's Revenge and many other ships with some variation of revenge in the name, and I like that. It's, it's an advertisement of intent in some fashion. But a bunch of ship names are less cool. You've got the Fancy, you've got the Royal Fortune, you've got, more recently, the Dainty. Not exactly striking fear into the hearts of men, is it? But Lord Clifford commissioned a 900-ton, 38-gun... Well, it wasn't a galleon, exactly. It had many of the same capabilities as a Spanish galleon, though. It was certainly the largest ship that had been built in Britain since Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, built his Henry Grace Adieu. And Queen Elizabeth herself took the liberty of naming that vessel. She called it Scourge of Malice. Scourge of Malice kind of has a double meaning, doesn't it? It could be a malicious scourge that was used against England's enemies, or... It could be a scourge to be used against malice, to bring peace between long enemies. Now, a scourge of malice was originally intended to be a West Indian vessel. It was meant to sail to the Americas and aid Sir Francis Drake in his campaign against the Spanish. However, Cumberland, who was set to captain the scourge of malice, had three false starts— once he was recalled almost immediately after leaving England by the Queen, and twice there was a bout of bad weather that forced him to return to England for repairs. That proved to be disastrous for Sir Francis Drake. Had Cumberland managed to make it to America, perhaps Drake wouldn't have been fatally wounded in a battle at San Juan. However, Cumberland, acknowledging the sacrifice made by Sir Francis Drake, renamed Scourge of Malice. He named the most powerful ship in the English Navy Red Dragon. Now, while all this was going on, while Cumberland was building ships and courting people to invest, there was some drama concerning Madre de Dios, in particular the accounting of the treasure on board. The question stems around whether or not any actual plunder took place, and if so, exactly how much was stolen. That's a matter of debate, a question that we'll likely never know the answer to, but it led to a fair amount of contention about the shares that the captains received. Lord Cumberland and Sir John Burrow, the admiral of the fleet that captured Madre de Dios, both lodged official complaints about their shares. They were careful not to implicate the Queen in any fashion. Instead, they pointed the finger at Sir Walter Raleigh. They alleged that the report, which was overseen by Raleigh, made false conclusions about the total of the treasure and how much may or may not have been stolen. They alleged that possibly Raleigh was skimming off the top to enrich himself while shortchanging his comrades. It's not impossible that they were correct in this assumption, Sir Walter Raleigh wasn't exactly well known for his scruples. It's not outside the realm of possibility that he did shortchange his comrades. Whether or not he did, though, doesn't really matter, because that is what Clifford and Burrow believed. Now, Lord Clifford, the Queen's champion, received a balm from Elizabeth. She allotted him a sum of money in thanks for his good works in capturing Madre de Dios, and she aided him financially in the construction of Red Dragon. John Burrow, on the other hand, the admiral, remember, received nothing. He decried Raleigh loudly and publicly, and he did so often. At one such occasion, almost two years after returning to England on 7th March 1594, Sir John insulted Walter Raleigh in front of John Gilbert, who just so happened to be a cousin of Raleigh's. And Gilbert challenged Burrow to a duel. Burrow accepted and chose rapiers as the weapon of choice, and arrived at the fight ready to kill the cousin of the man who he believed had stolen his fortune. However, he lost that duel. Sir John Burrow was killed on the 7th of March 1594, and the question of his compensation was no longer an issue. 
despite leading the armada that captured Madre de Dios, John Burrow has been largely forgotten to history. The other names in this story, though, Walter Raleigh, Christopher Newport, James Lancaster, George Clifford, they are all famous Elizabethan adventurers. But Burrow, well, Burrow died too early for any of that. Madre de Dios would open up doors for the wealthy and well-connected in English society, and had Burrow accepted his paltry sum and walked through that door, perhaps we would remember him today, but he chose a different path. But it wasn't just the landed aristocrats that those doors opened up for. Similar doors were opened for the less fortunate but highly talented sailors and soldiers, and especially the merchants. It was merchants more than anyone else that George Clifford courted. He approached a number of rich and powerful men in and around London, anyone who had an interest in the spice trade, and, of course, who had the money, was approached and offered this investment opportunity. Historian John Key writes in his wonderful book, The Honorable Company, A History of the English East India Company, quote, The company's stock appealed to two very different types of investor. On the one hand, there was the shareholder primarily interested in a quick and substantial return on his investment. He might be anything from a tradesman to a courtier, but he had no obvious interests in the specifics of its trade. On the other hand, there were those who perceived some collateral advantage in the trade itself. The group consisted of wealthy and influential city merchants with extensive financial interests outside the company. These two types of investor may roughly be identified with the company's two institutional bodies, the General Court and the Court of Committees. These two bodies worked a lot like modern companies do today. The General Court was a body of shareholders who... Well, at first they were just investors, but later on they would meet maybe once every quarter or so to vote on big-picture company business and to hear updates on their stock in the company. The Court of Committees was a much smaller body of those employed in the day-to-day running of the company. When Mr. Key, the author of that history, mentions financial interests outside the company, he's talking about well, a bunch of different financial ventures, but the most prominent among them was the Levant Company. The Levant Company was a trading corporation that was vested with the power to trade with the Levant, which means the Ottoman Empire. They played a major role in the relatively positive relations between England and the Ottoman Empire, Elizabeth and Suleiman the Magnificent. The Levant Company came in second only to the Venetians when it came to trading with the Ottomans for goods traveling overland through the Mediterranean. However, those merchants who were interested primarily in spices and silk now found an opportunity to cut out the Ottoman middleman. They could cut out the overland trade routes and even undercut the Portuguese. There were quite a few people who found that very appealing, but three London merchants more than any other showed serious interest in Lord Clifford's plan to form a trading company with the Far East. You may remember James Lancaster as the commander of a failed 1592 voyage to the East Indies, but James Lancaster did gain personal knowledge of the sea routes and the sultans with which any such venture would be concerned. Lancaster, who was perhaps first into this fold, brought in his two most prominent financial backers from the Levant Company, Thomas Smith and John Watts. When I talk about rich and powerful merchants, this is who I'm talking about. And the word merchant has kind of a quaint connotation. You might picture people peddling sausage rolls on the corner, or perhaps when you think rich and successful merchants, you think... A clockmaker who makes very fine clocks sold in the highest courts in Europe. But no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Jeff Bezos. We're talking about captains of industry. Now, Thomas Smith and John Watts weren't landed gentry. They were commoners, for now at least, but they were both financial and political movers. They were middle class in... England at the time, but they would be very much considered upper class today. 
They were middle class in that they didn't have the dignity or the gravitas of the aristocracy, but they held just as much, if not even more, real power than most landed gentry. Some families of a certain quality, the Roosevelts, for example, wouldn't ever think about muddying their hands with merchant or political affairs, but of course, once one particular Roosevelt named Theodore decided to break that rule, he became one of the most famous, beloved, and powerful world leaders of all time. So these four men, Lord Clifford, Thomas Smith, John Watts, and James Lancaster combined their efforts to bring in all the financial and naval players that were active in England at the time. This small group, along with a cadre of more than 200 other movers and shakers, prepared a proposal. They were going to take it before the Queen in early September 1599. They argued the merits of their plan well. They pointed out that it served not only financial purposes, but military purposes as well. You know, they're at war with Spain, which of course puts them at war with Portugal, and breaking that monopoly, the Iberian monopoly on the spice trade, would be an unbelievable move, militarily speaking. But as the bard, William Shakespeare, an active playwright at the time, would have said, here's the rub. England's closest ally in all the world, and certainly in their fight against the Spanish, the Netherlands, well, they were already in the East Indies. And that should break down nicely. You know, if the Dutch take Asia away from King Philip and profit from that trade, England would have the opportunity to hack away at Spanish America and profit from those lands. It's a two-front worldwide campaign that would break up Spanish dominion all over the world. It would enrich the Protestant allies of England and the Netherlands. It's a win-win and nobody would have to get territorial here. It seems perfect. So those petitioners in September of 1599 were turned away. Elizabeth didn't want to destroy that perfect system. And beyond that, there was the question of peace talks with Spain. They were ongoing, and Elizabeth didn't want to endanger those talks by entering into the spice trade. But it actually might have been the Dutch who swayed Elizabeth here, who changed her mind on this decision. The American campaign was, well, the privateers were bringing in money, but they had as yet to really solidify any big money-making ventures over there. There were no major colonies, for example. And the Dutch were... Well, they were getting rich. They were bringing in huge hauls of Asian spices, so much so, in fact, that they didn't have enough ships to carry it all. To pick up the slack, they attempted to hire English ships for their ventures. And they offered decent rates, too, at first, 3,000 pounds, and then when the English demurred, they offered more like 5,000 pounds. And that's not bad for a ship that would be fully insured if she were lost, and was not involved in any other venture at the time. But the cargo, well, the cargo that they would have on board would be worth easily, easily ten times that amount. And it appeared that the Dutch were going to make yet a better offer, which only went to solidify the point that they had money to spare. The cadre of merchants who made that initial proposal came back a year later, in December of 1600, they pondered, before the Queen, why should our fine ships go to make the Dutch rich beyond their wildest dreams? Should not these English vessels enrich Englishmen? What's more, these merchants had more money and more ships and more men than they had had a year ago. Elizabeth was always a pragmatist. She tended to make the decision that would fill her coffers and the decision that would do the best to appease her most prominent subjects. And this time, she was swayed. Queen Elizabeth granted a royal charter to, quote, George, Earl of Cumberland, and 215 knights, aldermen, and burgesses, end quote. Lord Clifford was, at the time, the only landed man involved in the company, but everyone here was rich. The company's official name at this point was the Governor and Company of Merchants of London Trading with the East Indies. The governor in question, the nominal leader of the company, 
was Thomas Smith, the Sheriff of London. However, he would die in just a few months' time before they even went on their first voyage. The governorship passed on to John Watts. Now, this happened at the very end of 1600, but happening at the turn of the century kind of has a nice, round, poetic symbolism to it. Maybe it could be seen as a sign that the 1600s were going to be a big century, and, I mean, they were. It also means that the English East India Company was the first East India Company. Technically, at least, this company existed before their Dutch equivalent, but it would be restructured and rechartered a few years later, after the VOC, the Veringad Ust Indisch Company, the United East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, after they were founded. But before all of that drama could take place, the English had to sail for Asia. George Clifford sold the Scourge of Malice, the Red Dragon, to the English company at a very favorable price. And that ship now was officially the first East Indiaman. The East Indiaman was... Well, there isn't a particular type of ship called an East Indiaman. Any ship that was used for the East India trade was technically an East Indiaman. Of course, the Portuguese ship was better known as the Carrick. The Spanish vessel was the Galleon. And the Dutch had their own flute vessel. But this ship, the Red Dragon, served as a template for English and Dutch and French ships that would become the model for what an East Indiaman was for about 200 years. Now, they weren't galleons. The hull was less barrel-shaped than a carrick or a galleon, and they weren't quite a frigate. The holds were larger than a typical frigate to accommodate more cargo. The East Indiaman, much like the Red Dragon, could be manned by a relatively small crew but they also had plenty of guns on board, guns that could ward off pirates and, later on, interlopers into the East India trade. Now, that might sound kind of like a perfect pirate ship, but it really wasn't. Pirates tended to prefer sloops and frigates, which were sleeker and faster, they could intercept an East Indiaman easily, and they held more guns. But there were occasional East Indiamen that served as pirate ships in a pinch. They were the perfect ship for sailing into uncharted, potentially dangerous waters. And that was exactly where they were headed. Their enemies were many. There were the obvious enemies, the Spanish and Portuguese with whom they were currently at war, and there were the possible enemies, hostile natives and potentially hostile sultans. There were the invisible enemies that they were not prepared to deal with. Scurvy, malaria, dysentery, and cholera. And then there were enemies that they never would have expected. Enemies that would have been in the last place these Englishmen would ever have looked. Enemies who, when they arrived, were their closest friends in the entire world. The greatest enemy that the English would face in the East Indies would, after all, be their close allies, the Dutch. Next time, we're going to follow Red Dragon and James Lancaster into Southeast Asia. We're going to look at the budding enmity between the Dutch and English, these old, old friends. We're going to follow that relationship as it develops, from forced friendliness into open hostility, and finally, open warfare between nation-states. We're going to look at the relationship as it evolved between the reigns of Queen Elizabeth and the Glorious Revolution, which will catch us up, as far as the East India Companies are concerned, to our story in the Philippines concerning the Signet and Charles Swan and William Dampier. At the moment, they are enjoying themselves in the Philippines on the fringes of company power, but that crew is about to run headlong into both the Dutch and English East India Companies. I have had an episode outlined and mocked up for weeks now. 
about early modern economics and the differing theories between Spain and Portugal on the one hand, and England and the Netherlands on the other, at least in regard to empire. But I keep pushing it back, and back, and back, because there's always a Madre de Dios to talk about, or an exciting voyage, or something more fun. In the end, an episode about economic theory is just so boring. I mean, sure, it's probably important on some level to understand the different ways in which these imperial powers oppressed and enslaved, but is it a fun show? Not at all. There's no story, no characters, no drama to invest in. And in reality, those questions are divided upon a pretty thin line. So I'm not going to do that show. Instead, we're going to look at the first journey of the English East India Company, the voyage of James Lancaster and Red Dragon. Now, we're not doing that because it's a particularly consequential voyage. It wasn't. In terms of immediate consequences, there were virtually none. But it does introduce us to the other players in that region at that time. It introduces us to the transition moment between the Spanish and Portuguese in East Asia and the English and Dutch. It will give us a moment to look at those differing economic theories without getting too deep into the philosophy of it. We're going to be looking at that second hand, as it were, through the eyes of the English who were visiting for the first time. This is episode 128, The Sea Without End. When we left off, Queen Elizabeth had just granted a charter to the Governor and Company of Merchants of London trading with the East Indies. She did that in December of 1600. Just over a month later, in February 1601, James Lancaster had the fleet ready to sail. Now, Lord Clifford was first on the charter, as was proper for a man of his station, but he didn't hold any official position within the company. It was, of course, below him to do so. So he gave command to James Lancaster. Lancaster was the obvious choice here. He was one of the very, very few English commanders who had rounded the Cape of Good Hope. He was one of the few English commanders who had been to Asia. And the other most notable English commanders with those distinctions were either dead or indisposed. Francis Drake and Thomas Cavendish, dead. John Hawkins, old Richard Hawkins, in the Spanish prison. I mean, there really wasn't anybody but Lancaster to take this on. Maybe Walter Raleigh, but he was busy in America at this point. Now, Lancaster had served, in addition to his 1592 voyage to India, under Francis Drake and John Hawkins. He was a privateer who was one of the most prominent gentleman adventurers operating, but focus more on the gentleman of that. He was a sensible, pragmatic merchant more than anything else. Red Dragon was the flagship of the fleet, and the best prepared. Notably, Red Dragon had barrels of lemon juice on board, and every crewman was going to be given one spoonful of juice a day, with breakfast. And I wonder if that's a sign that William Hawkins was on board at the time. Remember, Hawkins was there on Francis Drake's nearly disastrous scurvy-ridden voyage only to have his life saved by lime juice. But we don't know that Hawkins was there. It's, in fact, equally likely that Lancaster was on that same voyage. However, the other three ships in the fleet, the Hector of 300 tons, the Ascension of 260, and the Susan of 240, they didn't have any lemon juice. Lancaster did not decree that everyone in the fleet had to carry it. He merely chose to carry it on his own ship. But that decision turned out to be a good one, in fact, it saved the voyage. All four ships got caught in the Atlantic doldrums, and they spent far longer at sea than they had originally anticipated. And by the time they reached the Cape of Good Hope, the crews of those three lesser vessels were severely weakened. More than a fifth of the crew had died from scurvy, and nearly all of those were on board one of those three ships. The crew of Red Dragon, on the other hand, were the very picture of vibrant health because every man had a tablespoon of lemon juice every morning. Clearly, that was what kept the crew alive. However, it would take 
200 years for any kind of citrus or anything containing any vitamin C to become official policy within either the Royal Navy or the East India Company. Why? Because a sailor's life is worth less than a barrel of lemon juice. It's no question why so many of these men would go on to turn pirate in the years to come. But for now, the crew of Red Dragon led the rest of the fleet to land at what would become Table Bay. Now, Table Bay is today overseen by Cape Town, South Africa, but of course, there was no European settlement there at the time. There was, of course, a city at Cape Town's location, just not a European settlement. The English traded with the local merchants for their necessaries, the victuals, the food and water, and some wood, but there was a complication here. There was another fleet at Table Bay, not a Portuguese or a Spanish fleet. A Dutch fleet was sitting there. Now, this wasn't Dutch territory yet, but they were pretty clearly laying claim on the region. And this is as good a time as any to talk about the Dutch in the East Indies. Even though the English had the first East India Company, and this was their first voyage, the Dutch had already been to the East Indies. Twice, in fact. It all began a few years back with some good old-fashioned espionage. It was in the midst of the Dutch War for Independence against Spain. King Philip had just recently closed all Spanish ports to Dutch traders due to the war. However, the Spanish authorities politely ignored Dutch shipping at Portuguese ports. Even though King Philip was king of both nations, it was kind of a subtle message there, saying, I'm not your enemy, and look, you still need that Iberian trade, and I'm leaving it open for you, so why not just come on home? However, a Dutch merchant, spy, and zee rover named Cornelius de Houtman sailed for Lisbon in 1592. Ostensibly, everything he was doing there was legal, but he spent his off time studying the maps and charts of Southeast Asia. He learned everything he could about Portugal's many voyages to India and the Spice Islands, and he took that knowledge home. About a year later, in 1595, Cornelius de Houtman and another Amsterdam merchant who had just returned from India organized the Long Distance Company for journeys to India. If one were to count this Long Distance Company as the Dutch East India Company in its first form, it did come before the English East India Company, but most wouldn't for reasons that will become apparent later. The voyage of the long-distance company was scurvy-ridden, and not tremendously successful. A number of men died, and in fact one ship had to be set adrift due to a lack of crew to sail her. Now they passed right by a major port in Indonesia, Banda Akei. That's a city on the western end of Sumatra, and usually it would be the first obvious stop. But they had to pass it by because the Portuguese were there already. Instead, they moved on to Java, to the southeast, and their main success on this voyage was the establishment of a trading colony at the small Javanese village of Bantam. This would go on to become the major Dutch settlement in Indonesia, and in fact, yes, the Bantam rooster is named after the roosters found on this island. The second Dutch voyage to Asia, from 1598 to 1600, was a much greater success. They netted a 400% return on their investment and made the decision, after that voyage, to ask Queen Elizabeth's permission to hire English shipping. We talked about that decision and the repercussions of that decision last time, but this voyage was not, in fact, under the long-distance company. It was under a different organization called the New Company for Voyages to East India. The names and the money behind this voyage came from different people, so it wasn't the same organization. And in the wake of that windfall, that 400% return on their investment, every Dutch merchant who had a ship and a crew set sail for Asia. There was a flood of Dutch ships sailing south and east. There were at least three and maybe as many as six different Dutch companies on one of these voyages, 
when James Lancaster arrived at South Africa at Table Bay. There weren't any open hostilities here. Everything was friendly on the surface, but it was tense. Kind of a, hi there, Admiral Lancaster. Where, uh, where are you going with that fleet of yours? So the English got out of there as soon as possible. They didn't want to push their luck, only to make landfall at Madagascar, which would soon become a traditional English stopover. It became a necessary English stopover in the later years, when the Dutch would officially begin their colony at Cape Town, and they became openly hostile with the English. There at Madagascar they traded for food and water, and they constructed a pinnace from a kit that they had on board Red Dragon. However, even though they were all recovered from scurvy, the crews ran into another health concern. The diarist on board Red Dragon wrote, quote, Those that died here died most of the flux, which, in our opinion, came with the waters we drank. End quote. They're talking about dysentery, and that's what it was. It tore through the ranks of the fleet. But it wasn't the only killer. For example, the first mate of Red Dragon did die from dysentery and he was going to be buried there at Madagascar on shore when the captain of the Ascension, Captain Brand, was being rowed ashore by the Ascension's bosun's mate. And then a crewman on board the Ascension, probably a gunner, decided to shoot off a volley in commemoration of his fallen comrade, the first mate of Red Dragon. That volley would score a direct hit on the boat carrying Captain Brand and the bosun's mate, and it would kill both of them. Turned out to be handy, because alongside the mate of Red Dragon, Captain Brand and the bosun's mate were duly buried. Much like the buying of lemon juice, it would take many, many years for the company or the Royal Navy to pass official guidelines about when it was appropriate to fire off commemorative or salutary shots. The voyage was a bit chaotic, but once they left Madagascar, things started going a lot more smoothly. Lancaster and his fellow captains were comfortable in the Indian Ocean, and they made it safely to Sumatra. They landed at the largest city in western Indonesia. That city was considered at the time, as it is today in fact, the door to Mecca, or sometimes it was called the porch of Mecca, it was the last stopover for Muslims from Southeast Asia on their pilgrimage to Mecca. That city was Banda Akai. That city was the seat of a sultanate that had very close ties to Mughal India. It had also served as a Portuguese trading post for several decades, not a Portuguese colony. There were already plenty of people there. No, they just had a presence in the region and had a loose trade alliance with the people of Banda Ake. And here we have the opportunity to talk about Portuguese imperial policy, to talk about how they succeeded and why, after a century, they failed in Asia. The Portuguese Carrick was the first ship to truly conquer the waves, even before the Spanish Galleon. A 20th century Portuguese poet named Fernando Pessoa wrote, quote, a sea with limits may be Greek or Roman. The sea without end is Portuguese. End quote. Their territory stretched from Brazil to Africa to Indonesia, all on the back of the Carrick. It was nearly as large as the territory that was occupied by Polynesians, but this was all under one single ruler. However, the Portuguese style of empire was different than that of, say, Spain, or later, of England and France. And that's what I think most of us think of when we think about colonialism. You know, Spain would claim territory in huge swaths. They would topple great empires like the Aztecs in their quest to control America. The Spanish took over cities, and if one of those cities proved too limiting, they'd just build a new one. They sailed over tens of thousands of settlers. They put down roots. They started having kids. And all of that led to a deeply complicated and troublesome caste system. 
that proved to be costly and occasionally uneven. But remember, Spain was operating on the viceroyal system. They had viceroys claiming whatever land they could and occasionally fighting each other for yet greater control. That's the system of a large country, a country with a lot of people and powerful rulers. Portugal was not a large country. They didn't have a ton of people. What they had were ships and a loose alliance with the English, which gave them access to even more vessels. So they didn't build an empire of land and colonists. They built an empire of the sea. Practically speaking, in real-world terms, that translates to small colonies in strategic locations, not, you know, Mexico. The Portuguese would conquer port cities if they had to. Sometimes they would just found new cities, or occasionally they would make alliances with local rulers. Whatever they had to do, they did to set up shop at these strategically placed locations. Whatever the tactic, though, they amounted to, essentially, supply depots and centers of commerce with which they bought and stored spices. They would occasionally have a few farms, but that was mostly just to supply the ships that would be coming in and to feed the people that lived there. They didn't have massive, sprawling plantations. It's a system that, well, it's not without the potential for abuse, but at first it worked smoothly enough. The Indonesians had lost the European market in 1453, essentially, and they were happy to have that market reopened but the Portuguese would take advantage. Once they were firmly established, they started making demands. They demanded lower prices and more privileges and then monopolistic contracts. And they did so because they could. The Portuguese were in a position to demand whatever they wanted. There was no competition after all. But by 1601, there was competition and it was growing quickly. The Dutch were out here cutting deals left and right. They were looking to undercut the Portuguese, and they were offering amazing prices. And beyond that, the Dutch were competing with one another. All of those many and varied Dutch voyages that suddenly appeared in Indonesia were all competing with one another to get the most spices possible. So, the Sultan of Banda Aceh realized he was in the position to make demands of his own. In this case, he demanded a Portuguese maiden for his harem. The Portuguese commander, the man who was essentially the admiral of Banda Akea, the man who the sultan made that demand of, said, Yeah, sure, whatever you want, buddy, but he had no intention of actually complying with the order. I mean, who was this guy to make demands of Portugal, after all? But then... When the commander failed to deliver that maiden, the sultan, now in a position to make demands, just kicked him out. I imagine at some point the commander turned around and said, wait, what, you were serious about that? But he was already out the door. You see, the sultan had just had word that a Dutch flotilla had passed by only two weeks ago. Now they were in the Spice Islands at the moment, but on their return voyage, they would be sure to notice the lack of a Portuguese presence in Banda Ake. And if not, well, someone would happen along. And that someone did happen along. James Lancaster of England in Red Dragon. He wasn't Dutch, but, you know, that's close enough. He just sailed in with no prior knowledge of any of what I just talked about, only trying to find a port. The Sultan gave the English a magnificent welcome. It was similar in tenor to the welcome that Charles Swan and William Dampier enjoyed in the Philippines, only grandiose in scale. The Sultan brought out elephants to carry the officers into the center of the city, to his palace. Once they were there, he assembled the captains of the fleet and allowed them to enjoy a rare and exciting dance performed by what the biographer called, quote, the king's damsels. They ate all the finest foods and enjoyed all the luxuries available in Banda Ake. Okay. 
Some of these were the sort of pleasures about which it would have been inappropriate to write at the time. Others of these were the sort of luxuries that would have been frowned upon in the Muslim world, but apparently the Sultan of Banda Akeh had no problems with drink. They would, according to later chroniclers, hold festivities in the middle of a river, with men submerged up to their chests and floating tables. Boats of beautiful servants would bring around food and drink to all of the revelers who would drink and eat all day out in the river. You know, I recently went on a float trip. I spent a few days on one of the beautiful rivers in the Smoky Mountains. I enjoyed myself on a kayak on the river for several hours, and part of that enjoyment stemmed from the drink. You know, I tried to keep it in moderation. You don't want to drink too much on a kayak in the middle of a river. But once you hit land, you realize just how much you've had to drink all day in the sun. And that is when you have to focus on maneuvering around in a kayak. If there were beautiful maidens bringing me drink at my whims, I imagine I would have had significantly more. The English, on this voyage and others, certainly did, and many of them died from that drink. And remember, this was in a time when these people largely drank nothing but alcohol. However, they had business to attend to. Lancaster brought out a letter from the Queen, a gold-rimmed letter penned by a royal calligrapher which greatly pleased the Sultan. But even more than that letter, what I think pleased him the most were the manners displayed by James Lancaster. Remember, he was a merchant captain for the Levant Company. He was something of an emissary between England and the Ottoman Empire. He had also been to India before, back in 1592, and visited with Muslim Mughal rulers. And that empire was the home nation of this sultan here. So Sir James knew all of the proprieties. The sultan was happy with the English and welcomed them as trading partners. They signed the necessary contracts. The English took over management of the formerly Portuguese factory, and then they began to bargain. Unfortunately, though, Ake was more important as a strategic naval city, a political entity, than it was a merchant city. All they really had to trade was pepper. And, you know, pepper's grand, but it's not the most valuable spice. It's nothing on, say, nutmeg. But regardless, they did buy up a bunch of pepper, tons and tons of the stuff. But Lancaster did have his eyes on richer halls, so he took them deeper into Indonesia, into the Malaccas, what the people on that voyage called the Islands of Spicery. They dodged a few Portuguese ships on their way into the Spice Islands, and they met with a Dutch flotilla there. And once again that meeting was all smiles and friendliness, but the Dutch admiral did write back to his commanding officers in the Netherlands. I'm not going to quote it. Instead, if I could be forgiven for paraphrasing here, that letter went something like, All right, guys, the English are here. They've got a bunch of ships, and they're looking to cut into our nutmeg trade, and that is not okay. But, you know, write me back. What should we do here? It was clear that this Dutch captain, who we will meet later in our story, was very displeased with the English presence. However, that would have been a pretty accurate representation of what the English were about here. They were looking to cut into the nutmeg trade. Currently, the nutmeg trade was controlled mostly by the Portuguese, but the Dutch did already have a fairly substantial presence. Which means that pickings were slim when it went to colonial holdings or even potential trading partners in the region. But there were a few, just a few, the opening passage of The Honorable Company by John Key reads, quote, Every overseas empire had to begin somewhere. A flag had to be raised, territory claimed, and settlement attempted. In the dimly perceived conduct of a small band of bedraggled pioneers, stiff with scurvy and sand in their hose, it may be difficult to determine to what extent those various criteria were met. 
The seed from which grew the most extensive empire the world has ever seen was sown on Pulo Rune in the Banda Islands at the eastern end of the Indonesian archipelago. As the island of Runnymede is to British constitutional history, the island of Rune is to the British imperial history. End quote. The island of Runnymede, by the way, is the location of the sealing of Magna Carta. To say that the island of Rune is comparable to Runnymede is a bold statement, but it does have teeth. Rune is tiny, a tiny island of virtually no consequence. It's only two miles by half a mile in size. It has no source of its own fresh water, and there are no settlements or buildings of any real note. There were some people on the island, but just a small village that was overseeing their grove. But that grove was of consequence. The trees of that grove were nutmeg trees. They were the primary source of income for the people of Rune. Now, usually... The merchants on the island of Rune would ship their nutmeg to other Indonesian islands to be sold to local merchants there. Those merchants bought it up to sell it to the Portuguese. That makes sense because the island of Rune didn't have nearly enough nutmeg to justify a colonial settlement. Unless, of course, you were late to the game and needed somewhere to get your nutmeg. The English were elated to find an island of spicery that didn't already have a European presence, even if it was tiny. The captains of the voyage treated the village elder of Pulo Rune with as much dignity and pomp as they had the sultan of Indonesia's greatest city, of the door to Mecca. Lancaster was courting the village elder and the people of Pulo Rune, and it worked. They agreed to sell him all the nutmeg they had available, but that still wasn't much. So he moved on to their neighbor island of Puloai, which was just as small, if not smaller, and bought their stores of nutmeg as well. He didn't get much from either island, but even still, it was an amazing investment. See, these traders, the people of Puloai and Pulorun, didn't usually charge very much for their nutmeg. They were, after all, trading with Indonesians who were going to mark it up to be sold to the Europeans. And, of course, those Europeans would mark it up once again when sold on the European market. But what Lancaster did was cut out that Indonesian merchantman. He bought directly from the supplier, and he even gave the people of Pulo Rune and Pulo Ai much better rates than they would have received from their Indonesian counterparts which made the people of Pulo Rune and Pulo Ai quite happy, and it made Lancaster quite happy because he received it at a much lower cost than any of his European competitors. But he did more than just buy nutmeg at Pulo Rune and Pulo Ai. He set up diplomatic ties and even the potential for a colonial settlement there. But with that business done, after nearly a year and a half away from home, the fleet turned around to return to England. The voyage home was equally long and arduous, but luckily they lost no ships and no cargo. They did lose quite a few sailors on the voyage, but sailors are cheap, and if a few sailors are to die, well, a few less shares have to be paid out. But when they returned to England, they found that things had changed there at home. Queen Elizabeth had died while they were gone, and James I sat the throne. They also discovered, to their dismay, that King James had recently acquired, somehow or other, a windfall of pepper, and he was busy selling that pepper to fill his royal coffers. When Red Dragon arrived with her own massive haul of pepper, James put a moratorium on the spice to anyone but himself. As you might imagine, a number of rich and powerful merchants who had a stake in the voyage protested loudly to the king, and so he relented. But that had almost equally as disastrous consequences. Pepper flooded English markets and the price therefore plummeted. The company 
with their first haul, mostly pepper, very nearly didn't earn their money back from this voyage. They did, but they had to tell their shareholders, who were deeply displeased with this news, that four-fifths of their initial investment would not be returned to them. At least, not yet. The company needed that money still to fund their next voyage, which, they assured everyone, would be much more profitable. They did, after all, have a line on that sweet, sweet nutmeg trade. And that would, in fact, be a lot more profitable. So much more profitable that King James himself would back one of their future voyages. And he would add a few titles to his already fairly grandiose list. In the years to come, King James I would be styled as King of England, Scotland, Ireland, France, Pulaue, and Pularoon. That is, of course, Pulo I and Pulo Rune. King James did not do so immediately, but he would do so after several more voyages of the English East India Company to Asia. As the company showed more and more promise, the king and his family and many of the most prominent members of his court would back the company. And then, once the Stuarts were kicked off the throne by the Civil War, the Commonwealth and Cromwell would back the company financially, and then, once the Commonwealth fell and the Stuarts were restored, they continued to back the company. Of course, that second run of the Stuarts, Charles II and later James II, would have to fight several wars with the Dutch due to their backing of the company, but more on that later. For now, the English had a presence in Asia, and that moment marks the dawn of one of the largest and most powerful empires that the world has ever known. The British Empire was unlike any empire in history, even the Romans, even the Mongols. The British were different, partly because they weren't necessarily a political empire. They were a mercantile empire. And I think partly due to that mercenary nature of this empire, the people of Southeast Asia and India and China were facing what would become one of the darkest periods of their entire history. Of course, that's all for the future. Next time, we're going to look at the expansion of the English East India Company as well as the Dutch presence in the East Indies. We're going to discuss the ever-changing landscape in Southeast Asia and look at the wars that were fought over control of the spice trade. And we're going to see how drastically that culture shifted between Queen Elizabeth and eventually the Glorious Revolution, which will bring us up to date with the crew of Signet, with William Dampier and Charles Swan, who were currently on the fringes of company power, but were about to run headlong into the English and Dutch East India companies. But before we leave today, I'd like to leave you with a hypothetical. I've spent the last three episodes talking about the relatively heroic, or if at least exciting, origins of the East India Company, the dashing, adventurous nature of the men who founded the company in its infancy. So imagine that you were a young southwestern Englishman in, say, 1714. Maybe you're from Devonshire, and... Your father had been a sailor, and his father before him, so of course, you were also a sailor. You'd grown up hearing stories of Devon's greatest sons. I'm talking about big names here. Francis Drake and the Hawkins clan, people like Walter Raleigh. All of them were from your region of England, and all of them had signed up to fight the Spanish in the Great Anglo-Spanish War. And they'd done so as privateers in service of their monarch and their country. And for that bravery, for the heroism that they showed, they were knighted, some of them were landed, they grew to be rich and powerful and celebrated, famous men. And some of those men went on to found the East India Company, the most powerful organization in your whole nation. That is what awaits those who serve their country. And so when your country calls upon you to fight in the war, this time a war of the Spanish succession, 
you follow in the footsteps of your forebears, of Francis Drake and the Hawkins. You sign up to become a private here, and you fight, and you suffer, and you lose friends, but all through it, you prosper, and you win profits for England. And then, after the war is done, England abandons you. They leave you on an island, a backwater, on the other side of the world with absolutely no support structure in place. They take their ships with them, and you realize that all of the glories of your forebears are a thing of the past. You, instead of growing rich and famous and powerful, were forgotten. How would you respond to that? Imagine that all you have is a small boat, maybe a boat you built yourself, and a gun, and a sword, and several thousand other men and women in your exact situation. I suspect that most of us would do exactly what the thousands of young men and women who were abandoned by England in this situation did. They declared their own independence and built a republic of pirates. That is yet far in the future, but I couldn't stop thinking about that when thinking about the piratical origins of this most powerful empire in the world. Today we're going to look at the origins and early years of the Dutch East India Company. In doing so, we will be setting out on the last leg of our voyage with the East India Companies, nearing the end of our look at the East India Companies. However, we're never really going to be done with the English or Dutch East India Companies, any of the East or West India Companies really. They're going to be here from here on out, menacing pirates and privateers from Australia to Madagascar to Nassau. They're going to be a major factor in the story from here moving on. In the West Indies, the story of the buccaneer era of piracy is kind of akin to the Wild West, and I mean the really Wild West, the pioneer era when fur trappers and prospectors would ride out into unknown territory to forge a life far from civilization. However, the stories of the Wild West that we all know and love, you know, cowboys and Indians and gangs of outlaws and robber barons, all of that is more akin to the high golden age of piracy. There are shades of Jesse James and Billy the Kid in the stories of Edward Teach and Bartholomew Roberts, and all of that has undertones of Robin Hood, of course. And the thing that all three of those archetypes have in common, aside from romanticized, dashing anti-heroes, is a theme. A theme of common people struggling against the oppressive weight of incoming civilization, of a progress that's going to leave them behind. It could be a story of Saxon bands of merry men robbing from Norman lords, or it could be a story of pioneer cowboys fighting against the land-grabbing railroad barons and oil men, or it could be a story of plucky privateers fighting a guerrilla insurgents against the aristocratic merchant empire of the faceless company. And, you know, in 500 years, we'll probably have highly romanticized tales about the space buccaneers operating in one or another asteroid belt. It's an ancient story that is told over and over again. And in our version of that story, moving forward, the companies are going to serve as our antagonist. Like the Sheriff of Nottingham, or the Sheriff of Tombstone. Not the villains, really. The pirates are still plenty villainous but the antagonist. And while I think about that, while we're here, you know, in those Robin Hood or Cowboy and Indian stories, there's always a greater antagonist. You might have to deal with the Sheriff of Nottingham or the Sheriff of Tombstone or Amarillo or wherever you are, but there's always something bigger they could call in. Nottingham could always call on Prince John to send in the army. The sheriff could always call in the U.S. Army, and in our story, moving forward, 
The company might serve as our primary antagonist, but there's always the possibility, if things get bad enough, they'll call in the Royal Navy. This is episode 129, A Tempest of Strange and Uncouth Violence. I'd like to look at a character. I was, in fact, ready to move on with our story, but it was this single player that convinced me to hold back and tell this tale. If you wanted a representative of these burgeoning companies, he very easily could be their face. The way he viewed the world and the policies that he made based on those views were going to shape much of the 1600s. He's not a king, he's not a lord, but his actions impacted people all across the world, people who would never know his name. And I wonder how to describe this man. The description that jumps to my mind comes from a piece of fantasy fiction, not Tolkien in this case, but a piece of fiction called The Gentleman Bastard Sequence by Scott Lynch. The hero of that story, a man named Locke, has a run-in with the local lord named Stragos, and Scott Lynch describes Stragos in a way that resembles the real-world character in question today. He writes, quote, A man of late middle years, surely nearing sixty if not already past it, a strangely precise man with squared-off features. His skin was pink and weathered, his hair a flat gray roof. In Locke's experience, most powerful men were either ascetics or gluttons, Stragos seemed neither, a man of balance, and his eyes were shrewd, shrewd as a usurer with a client in need. End quote. That's what comes to my mind when I look at a painting of the man in question today. The historian Stephen R. Bone describes that painting in his book Merchant Kings when companies ruled the world and does a much better job than I could. He writes, quote, the man stares from his portrait with rigid, self-righteous indignation. Sleek and manicured, Jan Pietersoon Cohen was a man of impeccable grooming, from his slicked hair to his neatly trimmed Van Dyke beard, from his coiled mustache to his expensive clothes. He stands erect and stiff, almost regal, while his left hand grips the handle of a sword. His lean and hungry face is dominated by a large, hooked nose and eyes that do not betray a shred of humor or liveliness. They do not hint at warmth, forgiveness, humanity, or empathy. Overall, the painting conveys an impression of humorless arrogance. End quote. Bone goes on to describe one event that encapsulates perfectly the remorselessness of a man like Jan Pietersoon Cohen. Cohen was fostering the daughter of one of his associates, while well, his associate was back in the Netherlands, a girl of twelve named Siarte. Cohen discovered Siarte in the arms of one of his soldiers, a boy of fifteen. Cohen's initial plan was to drown Siarte in a tub of water, but he was talked out of killing his foster daughter by another of his men in favor of a public whipping of this twelve-year-old girl. The young soldier, though, was beheaded that very day. Cohen was cruel and harsh. He was, more than anything, unforgiving. He was one of the most powerful and influential men of the early 1600s and the architect of the Dutch East India Company. He didn't found the company, but he made it the powerhouse that it was going to be. He came from a relatively well-off background and was educated in Amsterdam. Then he was apprenticed to a merchant, maybe a relative, off in the city of Rome. And while there, learning accounting and the ropes of being a successful merchant, he picked up some Italian and Portuguese, some French, Spanish, and Latin. And I imagine that he picked up a fair bit of English as well, but he was never known to lower himself to speaking it. Cohen hated the English, which is a bit odd, considering that as the Puritans were rising to prominence in England, Cohen shared a lot of views with them. 
despite being a Calvinist. He hated adultery, he hated alcohol, he hated anything that was sinful, but not because, as the Puritans believe, it distracted from God. Cohen didn't much care about that. He hated sin because it distracted from his one true love, the hunt for profit. I don't think it was the money that Cohen loved. He wasn't greedy, exactly, but it was the hunt for money and the power that that money gave him. Anything that got in his way, including drink or adultery in himself or his men, and those dangerous emotions like empathy and compassion, had to be quashed. Cohen was there in Amsterdam as an employee and representative of his family's company when a coalition of Dutch companies decided to join forces under one umbrella. Remember all of those separate Dutch companies that were busy competing with one another in the East Indies for the spices that were available there? Well, they were about to unite under the umbrella of the United Dutch East India Company. We would call them the VOC. It was the unification of dozens of companies, but also the unification of the Dutch East India trade as a whole. They in the Netherlands, held a monopoly. They were the only organization allowed to trade with the East Indies, and if you wanted in on that, you had to join their ranks. And to ensure that it would be truly unified, not just a coalition of Amsterdam merchants, they wrote a charter with relatively equal representation throughout the Netherlands. They had a limited number of governors, and they limited the number that could come from Amsterdam to eight. The governors of Amsterdam would be unable to hold a majority. They still held half the seats on the council, though. The other eight seats represented a revolving series of states and provinces in the Netherlands, but in that fashion, everyone had the opportunity for a voice. Cohen was on the earliest of the Dutch East India Company voyages to Southeast Asia, and he was present when a Dutch admiral oversaw the signing of a contract, a contract that gave the Dutch a monopoly over all of the nutmeg trade in the Spice Islands. Now that contract was signed by a leader on the Spice Islands, but it wasn't written in their local language, Malay. It was written in Dutch a language that this local leader could not read. It was a foul bit of double-dealing, but that's not even the worst of it. There was a clause in that contract that allowed the use of force by the Dutch to enforce that monopoly. Should anyone who was bound by that contract sell nutmeg or cloves or pepper to, say, the English or the Portuguese or anyone that wasn't the Dutch, they could be made to comply to the Dutch monopoly by force of arms. The Dutch could sail in and attack them for selling to anyone else. But then, there was a question of exactly who was bound by that contract. Allow me a moment to paint a picture of maritime Southeast Asia around 1600. Now, most of the larger islands in the region belonged to one or another of the several different Islamic sultanates. There was, for example, in western Sunatra, the guy at Banda Ake, which James Lancaster met and cut a deal with. We talked about that last time. The Malakas Sultanate, probably the most powerful sultanate in the region, was up in Malaysia and Borneo. There were several other sultanates in the Philippines, there were a few on Java, they were all over the place. They all had their own politics and alliances, some were close to China, some to Portugal, some to the Netherlands, all of them were loosely allied with one another as well, but all of these powers encircled the Malaku Islands, the Spice Islands, and... While all of these different powers, including the Chinese and the Vietnamese, anyone who had an interest in the region, while they all had their own spheres of influence, they rarely built settlements, at least extensive settlements, on the Spice Islands. Occasionally, they would build a harbor or a factory or both, 
but rarely anything expansive. And the reasoning there is simple. Nutmeg trees are particular, especially about soil and climate, and they grow better on these few tiny islands than anywhere else in the world. These nutmeg groves are much more valuable than a city would be. Best just to leave them be, and to let the locals who had been tending them for generations and knew how, best to leave them alone as well, to control the trade, but not the cultivation. So politically, most of the Spice Islands were not under the direct control of one or another of the powers in the region. Instead, they were governed by local elders, leaders called Arongkaya. Some of these local leaders were merely leaders of a village. Some of them were more like governors, some of them more like warlords. But they remained independent, not only from the outside powers, but from each other. And that point is key. They were separate entities. You know, they shared language and culture and a region and often religion. But they had no political hegemony. And then, in the very center of the Malaku Islands was a smaller island group, inside the Malaku, but a subgroup within them. And on that small group of tiny islands is where nearly all of the nutmeg in the world was grown. And, you know, not because it couldn't grow elsewhere, but limiting it to these few very, very small islands allowed the Indonesians and then the Portuguese to control exactly where it was cultivated. This small group is called the Banda Islands. Pulo Rune and Pulo I, who have been trading with the English ever since 1601, were the smallest of the Banda Islands, but there were six other islands in the island group, and we're concerned with two of them today. The first is called Nira, of moderate size in relation to the other Banda Islands, but it lies directly north to the largest island in the Banda Islands, called Besar, or, depending on who you ask, also called Lanthor or Great Banda. The Dutch admiral who carried the treaty in question, the one under whom Jan Cohen served on that first voyage, got that treaty signed by an Orangkaya on Nira in 1602. The Dutch chose to do this in a direct response from the 1601 opening of relations between the English and the Bondanese islands of Pulo Rune and Pulo I. But here's the thing. That treaty should have, according to the customs and laws of the Indonesian people, only applied to the Orangkaya in question, who only controlled a small part of the island of Nira. But the Dutch thought otherwise. One man in control of a small region had signed a treaty that he could not even read, but in their minds, in the Dutch mind, that applied to everyone on the island of Nira. Not only to everyone on Nira, but everyone in the Bandanese islands. Including, but not limited to, Great Banda, and the English allied islands of Pulo Rune and Pulo I. Now, was this just a misunderstanding, a difference in cultures between the people of the Netherlands and Indonesia? Was it an honest miscommunication? Maybe there are those who have made the argument that it was just an honest miscommunication, a difference in culture between the Dutch and Indonesian people, of course, that viewpoint is wrong, because that's obviously not the case, because it was obviously a deal made in bad faith from the very start. And I should point out that some of the people who made those arguments usually held doctorates, but does it count if your doctorate is from Oxford in Orientalism from 1895? No, no it doesn't, you're wrong, this was made in bad faith. And I think as do most respectable modern historians, that the things that are about to follow show that pretty clearly. So, Jan Pieter Soon Cohen was there. He saw that treaty signed. He probably served on one or two more company voyages, but he was also there a few years later when Jan Cohen saw what has been dubbed 
the vile Bandanese treachery of 1609. On that voyage, Cohen was sailing under Admiral Pieter Verhoeven in April of 1609 when they arrived at Great Banda, only to spy an English ship at anchor there. The English had been trading at Great Banda with some freedom. Remember, nobody on the largest of the Bandanese islands was bound by the contract signed by someone on Nera. So the English, when the Dutch arrived, were all smiles. But Verhoeven, the admiral, made it clear that the English were not welcome here, and if they continued to attempt to trade at Great Banda, they would be fired upon. The English captain, William Keeling, thought for a moment about fighting for it, but he didn't have the numbers or the power, so he weighed anchor and headed off to Pulo Roon, where he could buy his nutmeg in peace. Verhoeven was... well, I was about to say that he was angry, but I hesitate to say that. I don't want to put any emotions into his head. I don't want to ascribe any motivations for what's to come. What he did was land 250 soldiers on Great Banda, and he summoned all of the Orangkaya to the town square. That was a number of smaller local elders and sort of the governor of the entire island. He produced a copy of the contract that had been signed by a different Orangkaya on a different island, but this time he had a Malay translator there to explain the contract and the situation. These Orangkaya, and in fact all of the people of Great Banda, and in fact all of the people of the Banda Islands were, according to Verhoeven, bound by law to trade with nobody but the Dutch. Now that's not true, but it is hard to argue with 250 heavily armed soldiers. And as Verhoeven was making this proclamation, the island's volcano erupted. Let's play with some alternate history here. Say you live in California, Southern California, coastal Southern California, in 1944. We are busy at war with the Japanese, and all of a sudden you spot on the horizon the largest armada that the world has ever seen. It's the Japanese, and they've come for your lands. They bombard the shoreline with the biggest naval guns in the world before landing an army of unprecedented size made up of Chinese and Korean soldiers and they tell your people, the governor in fact, that this is now Japanese territory. You might think about fighting, about resisting these invaders when all of a sudden the big one hits. An earthquake, a legendary earthquake. Some of the most populous land in all of the United States of America falls into the ocean. Thousands died in the Japanese bombardment and thousands more in this sudden and shocking act of God. Logically, you might know that this has nothing to do with the Japanese coming, but the illogical part of your mind might see that as a very, very bad omen. It might just break your will to resist. And if that wasn't enough, the Japanese landed another 10 or 20,000 soldiers on Californian soil. That's exactly what Verhoeven did, not 10 or 20,000 soldiers, but an additional 500 men were landed on Great Banda, bringing the total to 750. Verhoeven claimed a spot of land in the capital where he began to build a fort. This was... Not exactly unprecedented, the Portuguese had done similar things, but it was out of the ordinary. A harbor was one thing, but a fort was something else. This was a clear sign that the Dutch intended to enforce their contract, a contract that these people had never agreed to. So, the leaders of Great Banda knew that they had to make a deal. They asked Verhoeven to meet with them and negotiate something. They said that they were prepared to work something out here. And Verhoeven agreed. However, the Bandanese, the leaders, the Orangkaya, said that no contract signed at the point of a lance could be valid. 
They asked Verhoeven to come with his personal guard, enough men to defend him, of course, and his top merchants. They asked him to come to a clearing in the dense jungle far from his 750 soldiers. It was a sign of good faith, they said. Verhoeven, who was supremely confident in having already won the island, agreed to these terms and included Jan Pieter Soon Cohen in this retinue. They arrived, as agreed, with only a light guard. Verhoeven sent Cohen in to scout out the clearing, and Cohen saw a few men peeking out from the trees, which he found suspicious. But these men came out into the clearing, and they were all old men, Orongkaya and unarmed. And now, reassured that there were in fact no soldiers, they asked Cohen to invite Verhoeven and his guard into the clearing where they could sit down and discuss terms. But it turns out that was all Cohen was there to do. It was far above his station to engage in negotiations like this. He would have to wait behind. So he stayed, back in the tree line, while Verhoeven and his guard and his top men went in to discuss terms with the Orangkaya. Cohen would later recount, quote, Being entered among them, Verhoeven found the woods replenished with armed blackamoors, bandanese, and Orangkaya, who instantly encircled them and without conference treacherously and villainously massacred him. End quote. They had darts and lances with poison tips. They had blades with which they cut off heads. It was a massacre. But I should make my biases well known here. I am fully on the side of the Bandanese. I think they were completely within their rights, and I think that in a smaller situation, most juries would agree with me. The Dutch actions from the beginning here on Great Banda had been illegal and unethical. I mean, imagine somebody moves into your home, but they do so at gunpoint. They do so without permission. What would you do? What would you be within your rights to do? Personally, I think you should absolutely cut their head off and display it on your porch to make sure that nobody else tries to move into your home without permission. So let's play another alternate history game also on the West Coast, but this time in the modern day. Imagine that Japan, say, signed a deal with the state of Washington to reduce ocean plastic. That's a good deal, but then the Japanese show up a couple of years later in California, and they are demanding of the Californians to know why the Oregonians aren't adhering to the deal. And then the Californians rightly who signed no deal, kick them out. And then the Japanese come back, and they massacre thousands of Californians, and build a city where Los Angeles used to be. That's what was coming for the people of Great Banda. And just to be clear, despite having used the Japanese as the bad guys in two separate analogies, I bear the Japanese people and nation no ill will or bad blood. I think it's because I've been reading a history of Japan lately. But the people of Great Banda were facing a brutal retribution at the hands of none other than Jan Pieter Soon Cohen. He, having not been present at the actual meeting, was one of only a handful to escape the quote, vile Bandanese treachery, and it shaped his opinions of the people of the Banda Islands. It, well, he saw them as murderous, backstabbing contract breakers. It also, though, cemented his opinion of the English, whom he hated. See, Cohen believed that the English captain, who had been chased off only a few days earlier, were behind the whole plot. He believed that they had snuck off and suggested that these Orangkaya do exactly what they did. And I don't think he was correct in that, but he might have been. But that really doesn't matter, because that's what Cohen believed. Back in Amsterdam, he would testify before the Governor's General of the VOC, and he would suggest that the company, quote, execute and practice all revenge possible, end quote. 
And that's exactly what they did. Sort of. Remember, this happened on Great Banda, but the Dutch sent a fleet instead to the island where that contract was signed, to Nera Island, and they set out on a campaign of torture and murder and rape and pillage and burning houses to the ground, all manner of violent excesses, a campaign so brutal that it would have made a buccaneer blush. Cohen was not present on that voyage, but he was promoted to senior merchant on his next trip, and in fact on that voyage he so impressed his captain that he was promoted to chief bookkeeper in 1613. Now, that might sound like a boring accountant's job, but that's essentially an on-site CFO. Imagine the CFO of Amazon, only Amazon has the U.S. Navy at their disposal. He wasn't crunching numbers, he was working with big picture ideas. And in fact, during his time as chief bookkeeper, he produced a treatise entitled Discourse on the State of India that was really influential at the time and that impressed his superiors at the East India Company. That treatise outlined his plans for Asia, plans that he was allowed to undertake when he was promoted to Director General, the second-in-command in the islands of Spicery. Next time, we're going to conclude the story of Jan Pieter Soon Cohen and his conquest, brutal as it was, of the Banda Islands and Southeast Asia. We're also going to bring the story of the Dutch East India Company and the English East India Company up to date with our overall narrative to 1686, where it's about to intersect with William Dampier, Charles Swan, and the crew of the Signet. Last time we talked about the Dutch merchant Jan Pietersoen Cohen. To call him a merchant isn't, well, it's not inaccurate, but it doesn't bring to mind the right kind of image, does it? He was a businessman in a much more modern sense, an executive, a titan of industry, even. He was one of the most powerful people of the early 1600s, despite not coming from an aristocratic background, despite not having a famous family name. Jan Pieter Soon Cohen was, in nearly every respect, a self-made man. He had many benefits going into life, a good education and a good family, but no power to speak of. He wrested that power away from his rivals, his underlings, and what were, in all but name, his subjects. Last time we talked about his rise in positions of power within the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, but today we're going to see him rise to an unequaled standing in Southeast Asia. This is episode 130, No Mercy. When we left off, the Dutch East India Company was in almost total control of the island of Nera, just to the north of Great Banda. That was their center of power in the Banda Islands, these small, nutmeg-producing islands in the center of what are called the Spice Islands, the Malaku Islands, which are in the center of Indonesia. But the island of Nira was not the extent of Jan Pieter Soon Cohen's ambitions. He wanted all of the Banda Islands. He wanted all of the Spice Islands. He wanted all of Indonesia. The main barriers to that goal were not the local populace, nor were they the many sultanates in the region or even the Chinese influence. The main barrier that the Dutch East India Company had in Southeast Asia was the English East India Company, and Jan Pieter Soon Cohen intended to see to it that they were pushed out. Throughout these sixteen teens, at the direction of Jan Pieter Soon Cohen, the VOC embarked on campaign after campaign, ruthlessly claiming former Portuguese territory all across Indonesia and India. They militarized the region during these campaigns. Now, English captains from the English East India Company would occasionally show up, 
Some of them even met with Cohen to barter for the right to trade in nutmeg. But Cohen was not friendly with the English. Often he was openly hostile to the English, and more than once an English fleet was chased off at the point of a cannon on the orders of Jan Pieter Soon Cohen. One wonders if this would have been company policy had somebody else been there directly overseeing operations in place of Jan Cohen. This was the dawn of what's called the Spice Race. Cohen ordered an attack on Puloi. This attack was not overseen by Cohen. He was not in command of it. Cohen was not a military man. He was a merchant. He was a financial man. He was the CFO. That attack on Puloi under another commander failed. See, both Pulo Roon and Pulo I had been militarized by the English. But it wasn't Englishmen fighting the Dutch incursion on Pulo I. It was a militia of Bandanese. The people of Pulo Roon and Pulo I, well, they saw what had happened to their neighbors on Nera at the hands of the Dutch. That campaign of terror, of burning people alive, of mass murder, of forcing girls into slavery, sexual and otherwise. And the people of Pulo Roon and Pulo I, well, they believed that the English were a safer bet. Later down the road, the English would, of course, be guilty of their fair share of atrocities. But for now, they were definitely winning the hearts and minds of the people of the Banda Islands. So the Bandanese on Pulo Roon and Pulo I, in fact, all across the Banda Islands, fought a guerrilla campaign with English muskets at their disposal. You can look at any number of proxy wars fought during the 20th century to see military advisors overseeing shipments of weapons and guiding the hands of local soldiers, but not officially fighting a war. The commander of that first attempt at the island fell into disgrace after he was repelled, but the Dutch, the East India Company, and the Navy came in force a year later. In 1616, they didn't send a militia, they sent an armada. That armada blockaded Puloi. The people were unable to bring in food, or to go out fishing, or to bring in water. And when they were weak, some of them near death, the Dutch sent their soldiers ashore. Once again, at the hands of the Dutch in the Banda Islands, we see the torture and the rape and the murder and the burning. It was horrible. It was always horrible, and it happened over and over again. But it was at that time, in the wake of the Dutch capture of Puloi, that King James I of England adopted King of Pulo Roon and Pulo I as a part of his royal title. He's very clear here that he intends these to stay English territory. A year later, 1617, Cohen was planning another similar raid on Pulo Roon, but his bosses, who of course had constant communication with their men in England, wrote Jan Pieter Soon Cohen and told him to cool it with attacking the English. They ordered him to refrain from any, quote, maltreatment, end quote, of Englishmen, and they ordered him even to pull his forces back from Puloi. It looked very much like the English were planning a war, and the company did not want that, but Cohen was furious. He wrote his superiors in the East India Company, quote, If by night and day proud thieves broke into your house who were not ashamed of robbery or other offense, how would you defend your property against them without having recourse to maltreatment? This is what the English are doing against you in the Moluccas. Consequently, we are surprised to receive instructions not to do them bodily harm. If the English have this privilege above all other nations, it must be nice to be an Englishman. End quote. I love that letter. I 
clearly hate Jan Pieter Soon Cohen, but that letter, oh, you can feel the teeth clenching behind it. Jan Cohen was going to go on to do all that he could to ensure that it was not nice to be an Englishman in Southeast Asia. He was promoted to Governor General of the VOC, the top position in that organization in Asia. He still had to report back to the Council of Governors, but in Asia, where it took a year to hear from or get news to those governors in Amsterdam, his rule was absolute. He was at the time 31 years old. The Council of Seventeen, the Council of Governors of the VOC, promoted him on the one condition that he would not engage in any violence with the English. And Cohen agreed. But Cohen was lying. And remember that all throughout this period, the Dutch were expanding at a massive rate. They were making inroads in Thailand, which they called Siam, and in Vietnam, which they called Indochina, and at Nippon, which they called Japan, as per the Chinese name. And all of that is great. It's bringing wealth and power and influence to the Dutch company. But the tiny, minuscule, insignificant little specks of land called the Banda Islands obsessed Jan Pieter Soon Cohen. They were, after all, the source of all of the world's nutmeg, potentially the most valuable commodity in the world. And they weren't yet entirely in his control. He had a lot of influence there and bases of power, but the English still held Pulo Roon and Great Banda, the jewel of the Banda Islands, eluded him still. And he blamed the English for much of that, and as it turns out, he blamed them correctly. I don't know that the English were in fact behind the vile Bandanese treachery of 1609, but at this point, there is no doubt that they were backing the Orang Kaya in their guerrilla campaign against the Dutch. So, he sailed away from the Banda Islands. Jan Cohen sailed for Jakarta, which was neutral territory that did not belong to the English or the Dutch. It was the seat of a sultanate, ruled over by a man they called the Prince, and both the English and the Dutch, and the Portuguese even, had factories there. For a time, Cohen appeared to be doing as he was told, to be working with the English, not against them. And then, with some flimsy excuses, Cohen ordered the English factory in Jakarta burned to the ground, and he ordered every Englishman there arrested. I mean, think about it. Even if these Englishmen, these specific Englishmen, were working directly with the Orang Kaya and supplying them with weapons, well, you couldn't arrest them on foreign neutral territory. That's kind of the deal with neutral territory, right? And Jan Cohen succeeded in his mission. He did burn that factory to the ground, and he did have those men arrested. But wouldn't you know it, just as he was beginning to clean up the mess, an English armada, significantly more powerful than his own, sailed into Jakarta. It became pretty quickly apparent to the English commander, Sir Thomas Dale, exactly what had happened. So he blockaded the harbor of Jakarta. Nobody was allowed in or out. He had a full eleven warships, large ships of the line, versus Cohen's seven smaller ships. Now, Sir Thomas Dale demanded surrender of the Dutch, but Jan Cohen refused. And much to Admiral Dale's surprise, on 2nd January 1619, Cohen lined his ships up for battle. Now, there was no way he could defeat the English, but maybe he could break the line. The Dutch advanced on Dale's ships. And what followed was called, quote, a cruel and bloody fight, end quote. Imagine being the Prince of Jakarta. You have prospered by doing business with the English and the Dutch and having a neutral territory. And you're looking down on the harbor from your palace window and you see the blockade. 
you see these two fleets of European warships lined up for battle, and then they fire. Unfortunately, you would not be able to see very much after only a few minutes, as the air would be filled with smoke. Maybe you could see the masts above the smoke faltering and falling, and of course you wouldn't be able to hear much over the roar of the guns, but between volleys you might be able to hear the endless screams of pain echoing across your city. It was a sudden and brief battle, with the smaller Dutch vessels trying to cut their way through the English blockade. And Cohen was defeated, kind of. He managed to escape, but his fleet was broken and bloodied. His ship was only one of three that managed to make it out. Nonetheless, his ship, broken as it was, made it to Nera, to regroup and to go on the offensive against the English in Southeast Asia. However, if at this point Admiral Dale had been a man of cunning, he could have destroyed the Dutch Admiral and trounced them from Southeast Asia, maybe forever. Maybe he could have claimed the entirety of the Banda Islands, maybe the entirety of Indonesia for the English East India Company, but that wasn't his mission. His mission was one of trade. He was so heavily armed because of the violence that had been shown by the Dutch. So instead of making for Banda and destroying Jan Cohen, he managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Stephen R. Bone calls Dale, quote, feckless and unfocused, end quote, and that sounds about right to me. Dale sailed off for mainland India. He frankly, probably didn't know how to proceed, and that gave Cohen time to secure his hold and to tighten his grip. In his absence at Jakarta, the Dutch militia that was still there poked their heads out from their hiding places, and they looked around, and they saw no Englishmen in sight, and they claimed the city as a Dutch protectorate. They renamed the city, quote, as Holland used to be called in days of antiquity, Batavia. This was the first open warfare, the first acknowledged shots fired in the conflict between England and Holland, a conflict that was going to dominate the second half of the 1600s. However, before the English and the Dutch could duke it out on the main stage, there were other wars to fight. Wars that would be larger, and more destructive than anything the English and the Dutch could do to each other. Back in Europe, the Holy Roman Empire was on fire. The emperor was weak, and at the moment, princes and city-states were at war with one another. It was a German civil war. But of course, the Dutch were still engaged in their Eighty Years' War, their war of independence against Spain, and the Spanish Habsburgs were close allies to the Holy Roman Habsburgs. The Dutch saw this opportunity to join the fray, to further weaken Habsburg hegemony there in Europe. Joining what would later be called the Thirty Years' War was central to the Netherlands' plan for independence. However, and this cannot be ignored, if the Dutch were going to win this war, they had to ensure that their allies, and they were allies, remember, to the rear, the English people, weren't going to get angry about all of the death there in Asia and attack them, do so in retribution for Cohen's reckless actions against the English. The Dutch government was very concerned that this one man, Cohen, was going to ruin their chances for independence in his own struggle for power and greed. So England and the Netherlands, as well as the governing bodies of both the VOC and the EIC, all got together to have some discussions, to work out some deals, and to sign some treaties. And we're not talking about the kind of contracts that were signed on Nero, we're talking about ratified, formalized treaties with ancient and powerful names at the bottom, signed in the halls of power of both nations. 
These were treaties to ensure that both nations would be allies against the Habsburgs in this coming conflict, and that they were going to work together to oust Spain and Portugal from Asia. Forever. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of rich and powerful aristocrats and leaders of industry telling you not to do anything stupid. Cohen bowed to that pressure. He agreed to make peace with the English and even offered to lead the effort of the Allied forces against Spain in Southeast Asia. Truly an admirable individual the kind of fellow who can put years of hatred and bad blood and animosity behind him to lead the forces to work against a common enemy, the sort of person that we should all look up to. Am I right? Of course, I'm lying to you. I'm lying because Cohen was lying. He had no intention of honoring that treaty, no matter the pedigree of names that graced it. Cohen is not only indicative of the company's policies, but of the shift in culture. He was going to flout these rules set down by great aristocratic, powerful ancient families in the name of profit. And he was going to do so by using lawyerish tricks, loopholes in the law, all, of course, stage-managed by he himself. That line may be my favorite line in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Loyalty is no longer the currency of the realm. I'm afraid currency is the currency of the realm. He was going to be able to do so because he had agreed to be in command of the Allied forces in Southeast Asia, and he was able to send the English off on useless, faraway missions. Yes, yes, we need you in India. Yes, we need you in Japan. Yes, we need you in the Philippines. And at just that moment, Jan Pieter soon Cohen noted a rise in guerrilla attacks on the tiny, inconsequential, yet infinitely profitable island of Great Banda. The Dutch stronghold on the island, and they did have a fort, although the island was not pacified, was called Fort Nassau. And at the moment... He says it was under siege. Cohen demanded, since he was in overall command, that the English, according to the terms of their agreement, immediately provide one-third of all their ships and men to aid him in defense of Fort Nassau. Those were the rules of the treaty, but of course the English were unable to abide by the rules of the treaty because he had sent them all to India or Japan or somewhere far away. Cohen created a situation in which the English, through no fault of their own, would be in violation of the terms of the treaty, and he was in a position to declare the treaty itself null and void. Not the treaty between England and Holland that affected affairs on the continent during the Thirty Years' War, but in Southeast Asia, his word was law. Now, I acknowledge that I am vilifying Jan Pieter Soon Cohen here, but he absolutely deserves it. Jan Pieter Soon Cohen was evil. However, he was right, at least about the English on Great Banda, arming and aiding the rebels. Now, the question here is whether or not this was an official English policy. That would, of course, be in violation of the treaty. Was it perhaps an English East India Company policy that would be in violation of the company agreement? Or was this the action of interlopers? of men who were no better than pirates operating of their own accord. And that is the question. That's always the question. The question to which I am ever searching for an answer. It's the excuse to which the English always turn time and time again. They were operating of their own accord. Outlaws. No, 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 no. Just pirates. And we don't know the answer in this case to that question. 
Regardless, there were English on Great Banda aiding the rebels there. They had a coalition of leaders from the Banda Islands, nearly all of the Arongkaya from the Banda Islands, there on the island, helping to defend their largest and most important property from Dutch incursion. They were gathered there to lead the fight against the Dutch East India Company alongside their English allies. And Cohen was going to break that alliance. He brought a fleet in and dispatched one ship to encircle the island. They approached harbors and coves and inlets. They weren't there to land, they were there to draw fire from the gun batteries on shore and to note the location of those gun batteries. And they noted that there was one place that was undefended a perfect place to land a small boat and a small crew carrying large bags of coin. Coin that they would use to bribe a few key turncoats on the island, men who could sabotage the defenses of the defenders. And once those defenses were sabotaged, Cohen could bombard the shore and invade. He overran the Bandanese gun batteries, spiked the guns or carried them to his ships, and held the shoreline in a day. The guerrillas of Great Banda were all up in the mountains, where it would be almost impossible to flush them out. They knew the land far better than any of the Dutch ever would. But Cohen didn't need to flush them out. He could draw them out. Cohen set his men free and a reign of terror all across the island. Now this seems to be Cohen's M.O. It seems to be the Dutch M.O. at the time, but this was almost incomprehensibly terrible. I think about Queen Boudicca, the British Celtic guerrilla leader who fought the Romans. When Boudicca was finally captured and defeated, the Romans beat Boudicca in view of all of her soldiers, and raped her daughters in front of everyone who could have fought them. Imagine that only instead of one singular figurehead against which the Romans could show all of their scorn, it was the families of all of the Arongkaya, captured, brought into the center of town, beaten, raped, tied to the rack, flayed alive, beheaded, and burned. Not necessarily in that order. Over and over again they did this in every village. The tactic worked. It drew out the leaders, the Arongkaya of all of the Banda Islands. It drew them out of the mountains to offer their surrender to Jan Cohen. They did so with a gold band and a copper kettle, and Cohen accepted their surrender but he did so only with terms. First, the people of the Banda Islands were to give, as in for free, 10% of all of the nutmeg produced on their islands to the Director General, read Cohen, of the VOC. Second, the other 90% of the nutmeg produced on the Banda Islands would be sold to the VOC at prices lower than had ever been agreed to before. Third, the people of the Banda Islands would send him every man of a certain age to help build a Dutch fort and to work on plantations that would be controlled by the Dutch. They would not be paid wages. They would officially be slaves of the VOC. But Cohen agreed that they could stay at their homes and with their families and that the leaders who sold the nutmeg, would be allowed to distribute that money however they saw fit. And fourth, the Orangkaya, as of this very moment, when Cohen accepted their surrender, would be taken as hostages to ensure compliance. The elders agreed to these terms. They had no other choice. It was the only way to stop the horror that was occurring across their lands. But they were obviously unacceptable. The people of Great Banda would never be able to comply to these terms. It would be a destruction of their entire civilization. However, 
the Orangkaya agreed, and were taken into captivity. And that sacrifice bought the people of Great Banda, as well as their English allies up in the mountains, it bought them time, time to escape. And it worked. Many, many women and children who would have otherwise been unable to escape were taken onto English ships and relocated to Pulo Roon. They were refugees, but they were alive. They took as many as possible away, and many left on non-English ships, going as far as possible in their proa, which, as we know, can reach the ends of the earth. But even still, not nearly enough people were able to escape. After a few days' time, when the slaves who had been ordered to present themselves before Cohen did not appear... Cohen tried one final tactic to draw them out of hiding, to make the people of Great Banda agree to his terms. He had the 45 Orangkaya from all around the Banda Islands that were currently in his captivity brought out into the town square. Some of these Orangkaya were of lesser rank, mayors, we might think, some greater the governor class of Orangkaya. Of the lesser rank, Cohen had many of these tied to the rack and tortured with hot irons and coals. He only had one man at a time tortured, so this went on for several days. And yet his demands were still not met. So Cohen produced a surprise. He sent a messenger to his flagship and boat came back, carrying an elite guard of Japanese mercenaries, ronin samurai, each of whom carried an impressive and very, very sharp katana. Cohen's men knew what was about to happen, and many of them were disgusted, but they were unable to do anything. They were under Cohen's yoke just as much as their captives were. One of these... Lieutenant Nicholas von Wert wrote of what he saw. Quote, Six Japanese soldiers, with their sharp swords, beheaded and quartered the eight chief Orangkaya, and then beheaded and quartered the thirty-six others. This execution was awful to see. The Orangkaya died silently, without uttering any sound, except that one of them, speaking in the Dutch tongue, said, Sirs, have you no mercy? But indeed, nothing availed. He goes on, All that happened was so dreadful as to leave us stunned. The heads and quarters of those who had been executed were impaled upon bamboos and so displayed. Thus did it happen. God knows who is right. End quote. In the modern world, when someone says God knows how or why this happened, usually that is taken to mean nobody knows and it's impossible to know unless you are God, but that's not what the lieutenant meant here. His last line there, thus did it happen, God knows who is right, was the closing argument in Van Wert's testimony against Jan Pieter Soon Cohen. He is saying that thus did it happen, and God knows I am telling the truth. The rape and the burning had not worked. The torture of the men who led the Banda Islands had not worked, so Cohen had resorted to his last plan. But, in truth, this was his only plan. He was going to see this done one way or another, and that execution of all of the leaders of the Banda Islands was only the beginning. He was now poised to undertake the final phase for his plan, a plan that had been brewing. Well, I'll let Stephen R. Bone describe it. He writes, quote, His plan had been brewing since 1609. He wanted to depopulate the islands to replace their inhabitants with imported slave labor under VOC control. He proceeded with the ethnic cleansing of the Banda Islands. VOC troops burned dwellings 
rounded up entire villages, and herded the captives onto ships so that they could be sold as slaves. Thousands of men, women, and children died of disease and starvation. Barely a thousand of the original 15,000 residents remained in the Banda Islands. End quote. No reputable author, certainly no reputable author of history, uses a term like ethnic cleansing lightly. But that's exactly what was happening here. What Jan Pieter Zun Cohen did was not unlike the actions undertaken by Adolf Hitler in his search for German Lebensraum. It was not unlike the actions undertaken by... Josef Stalin, or Chairman Mao, or on the killing fields, it was ethnic cleansing. And though it was on a smaller scale than the actions undertaken by an Adolf Hitler, if we were to look at it per capita, Cohen might be one of the most successful ethnic cleansers of all time. However, his men, the men who actually did the work of that ethnic cleansing, were disgusted with themselves and everything they had done, but more than anything else, they were disgusted by the man who had pushed them into it, who very clearly would have had them killed and dumped into the ocean on the other side of the world from their homes had they not. And many of them gathered together to tell the Council of Seventeen exactly what Cohen had done. That testimony given by Lieutenant Nicholas von Wert was one of many men who had seen horrors the likes of which they would never, ever forget. Another officer who gave his testimony against Jan Pieter Soon Cohen to see that he was brought to justice said, Things are carried on in such a criminal and murderous way that the blood of the poor people cries to heaven for revenge. Cohen was found guilty by the Council of Seventeen, guilty of excessive force. He received from the Council of Seventeen an official rebuke. The governors of the East India Company realized that he had gone a bit far. But that's not all the Council of Seventeen gave him. The governors of the United Dutch East India Company also handed down to Jan Pieter Soon Cohen a bonus. A bonus of 3,000 guilders, that's 3,000 gold pieces, for his good works in securing the Dutch monopoly on all of the nutmeg in the world. That's not the end of the story. It's not even the end of Cohen's story. He would go on for years serving as the head of the Dutch East India Company in Asia. But it's the end of this story. From here on out, more or less, we're looking at a story that we've told before. It's the rest of the story of the 1600s, a century that was, from this point on, defined by war. And that warfare would shape the face of pirates and piracy moving forward. The pirates were forged in those wars. And those wars, at least those that dominated the second half of the 1600s, were wars created by the East India Companies. The Thirty Years' War was bigger, with bigger concerns, but, I mean, let's look at that even. England was briefly involved in the Thirty Years' War, but of course they fell into civil war and could no longer aid the conflict. The Netherlands obviously continued to be involved in the Thirty Years' War as part of their Eighty Years' War against the Spanish for independence, But in that war, in Southeast Asia at least, they played kind of a Soviet Union role. You know, the Soviet Unions in World War II marched one of the greatest armies that the world had ever seen. The Red Army liberated people up and down Eastern Europe from the Nazis, and that's wonderful. We all support people being freed from Nazi control, right? But then, what happens when the war is over? The Soviets rescued those people from Nazi control, but now it's Soviet territory. During the Thirty Years' War, once the English were occupied with their own conflict back in the homeland, the Dutch, both the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch Navy, 
they were fighting the Spanish in Southeast Asia. They were ousting the Spanish and the Portuguese from Indonesia, and all of that's great if you're allied to the Dutch in the Thirty Years' War. But during that whole time, they were militarizing. They were building forts and harbors and shipyards. They were building ships and cannon. And by the end of the Thirty Years' War, the Dutch were in control of almost all of Indonesia. And that's not all. They controlled the coasts of southern India and Africa. They controlled the coast of Brazil, and they controlled New Amsterdam in North America. And those are their bigger settlements, but they had outposts in the West Indies, and the Persian Gulf, and North Africa, and Japan, and China. They had a global empire. And then, of course, we see the wars that defined pirates more than any other wars, except for one, we see the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Three major conflicts between England and the Netherlands. Conflicts that have been the background of this show since almost the beginning. You know, every time we get a new crop of pirates, thousands of new young men that show up, it's always because of one of these Anglo-Dutch Wars, almost always. The most recent group of pirates on our show, the last of the Buccaneers. The pirates who were active in the 1680s, the crew of the Signet, for example, earned their chops in the Third Anglo-Dutch War. And as we move on, as we explore the 1690s, we're going to see a lot of old faces pop back up. Englishmen, Frenchmen, Dutchmen, privateers, sometimes buccaneers always. But you'll notice that the English and the Dutch, they were never at war there. And I mean, the French and the English privateers would sometimes be at odds. But Jan Willems, remember him? he sailed almost exclusively with Englishmen. In the Caribbean, things were amicable between the Dutch and the English, and not just among the pirates. Dutch ships were well known to supply and trade with the English on Jamaica. They did so even when the English were unable to do so. There were ships that belonged to the Dutch and East India Company that were competitors, ships that even in time of peace, might be staring each other down, sharing hard words, and preparing to square off for battle. But if a Dutch or a Portuguese ship showed up, they would all of a sudden turn and present a unified front. Occasionally, they got along. I mean, John Key, in The Honorable Company, writes, quote, Although the Dutch and English were bitter rivals throughout the East, on the long voyage to and from Europe, hostilities were suspended. At the Cape and St. Helena, ships of the London Company exchanged news and provisions with those of the VOC. Occasionally, Dutch and English ships actually sailed together. End quote. I wonder about that. I wonder why that is. The best answer that comes to mind is that the conflict between the Dutch and the English was a financial conflict at heart. It was about profits and goods and commodities and, more than anything, territory. But the conflict between the English and the Spanish, or the Dutch and the Spanish, or the English and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Portuguese, that was a conflict of ideology. There was a religious divide there, a schism over the soul, over God. And that would always take precedent with these people over profit. However, as time moves on, as we will see, God begins to fall to the background, and Prophet will take center stage. Next time, we're going to return to the crew of Signet, currently in the Philippines. The crew of Signet, really since they left the Americas, have been a bit less than piratical, thanks mostly to Captain Swan. They've been behaving as a crew of merchants should, However, as they whiled away the months on Mindanao, some of the crew was growing restless. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank everyone who has helped to support the show. All of our patrons on Patreon, those of you who have signed up to support the show through DonorBox or one of the other options on our website, everybody who has recommended this show to your friends or family or online, and everybody who has left a rating or a review. Without all of you, I wouldn't be able to do this. 
Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G.com.au. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can get in touch on Twitter, SoundCloud, Reddit, or YouTube. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.